So, uh, man, I was all excited about this. I got this cool video clip. Anyway, whatever. I'm excited about it. Noah's Ark. Uh, anybody hear anybody scoff about Noah's Ark? You mean to tell me that all the animals in the world got stuck on the ark, right? Nobody, if there really was an ark and it was really on the mountains of Ararat, you'd think they'd find some evidence. And Well, actually they have. And what's really neat is our study tonight, we're going to see that the evidence has been going on for quite some time. Fascinating research. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of the sightings of the ark happened before Jesus' first coming, believe it or not. And uh, which is what you'd expect if it happened that long ago. So anyway, you guys ready to go? All righty, you guys ready for tonight's mystery story? Joey? Okay, here we go. Uh, Even though God had clearly established his leadership for his people, this guy and his followers, Tom, they thought they knew better. In fact, they thought they knew better than God. Okay? You see, here was the problem. You see, they didn't like the way things were going, okay, let alone the direction they were headed. And so they decided to take matters in their own hands. And so they came to the leadership and they opposed them by saying, who do you think you are setting yourselves above the people of God? We are all holy. The Lord is with us. You have gone too far. Well, the existing leadership put it back into God's hands and said, in the morning, the Lord will show you who belongs to him and who is holy, and he will have that person come near to him. It's you who've gone too far. And sure enough, just like they said, the very next morning, they, when they all showed up, both sides of them, they stood before the Lord, and the Lord immediately spoke to his existing leadership, and he warned them by saying this, separate yourselves from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. But then, in an amazing act of humility, the leadership who had been spurned actually fell face down before the Lord, interceded for these people, saying, Oh God, God of the spirits of all mankind, will you be angry with the entire assembly when just one man sins? And so the Lord replied, all right, say to the people, move away from these rebellious, wicked men, or they too will be swept away because of their sins. Well, at this, the people obviously moved away. And so sure enough, the Lord did what he said. All of a sudden, just like that, the ground split apart. The earth actually opened its mouth, and these rebellious people, along with their families and all their possessions and all their goods, were swallowed whole. They actually went down into the grave alive, putting an end to their upstart rebellion. The book is the book of Numbers, and the judgment, of course, is Kor's Rebellion. Yeah, interesting. Now, how many of you guys, uh, Old Testament scholars, are familiar with Korah's Rebellion? All three of you. Praise God. Four. I'll get four. Give me five. I'll get a five. I'm going to see. No, just four. Okay, but anyway, that's right. Okay. And uh, the point, obviously, is we're seeing with the theme of these things, uh, these are actual judgments that are recorded for us in the Bible, okay? And what it tells us is just not just that God is real, but God is a God who what? He will judge sin. Sooner or later, even the sin of rebellion in this case, hey, listen, God's a, got a limit, so to speak. And when you least suspect it, bang, the hammer is coming down, okay? That's what we see in the scripture. Not just God is real, God is a God who will judge, okay? Now, what's the problem today? You know how the scripture says Satan has blinded the minds of those who don't believe? Okay, evolution has done just that. They blind the minds of those who don't believe. Okay, but even for those who want to break out of those blinders, even if you will, flirt with the idea that there is a God, one thing that our world today absolutely refuses to believe in is that God is a God who would judge. And not just God is a God who is a judge, but God is a God who will judge and put sin into account, right? But the problem is, hey, there's evidence all this world that God judged this world once because of sin, Noah's flood, okay? And when he says he's going to do it a second time, you better pay attention. But people aren't paying attention because of this skeptical, scoffing society and the lie of evolution that has blinded their minds. So we're going to help these people out by continuing our study, the witness of creation. And what we're doing is taking a look at the different evidences that God's left behind for us to show us that he's not just real, but we really can have a personal loving relationship with him through Jesus Christ, listen, before it's too late. You don't get a second chance. The only opportunity for you to be saved is right now here on earth. When you take your last breath, if you have not cried out to Jesus Christ, ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, trust your eternal destiny on his work on the cross, not your own, you're going to hell. And you're not getting out. God is a God who would judge sin. Now is the time, as the scripture says, to respond to the spirit of God and be saved. Okay? But this is how he's shown it to us. And the different evidences he's done that, we've already seen the first one, of course, was the evidence of an intelligent creation or intelligent design. We've been designed by God. The second evidence was the evidence of a young creation or young earth. Okay, uh, We have not been here for millions and billions of years. The third evidence was the evidence of a special creation. God is the one who made us. We did not come from the goo to the zoo to me and you. Okay, We came from Adam who came from God. Okay, The scripture is very clear about that. And the last five times, We saw in the fourth evidence is that God is a God who will judge, a judge creation. 
Okay, and again, the premise is God really did judge his planet once with a worldwide flood. And we've been looking at all the evidence, not just the biblical account, not that that's bad, but we're doing our homework in our skeptical, scoffing society and showing you there's plenty of evidence that God really did this. We've already seen with the evidence of levit, uh, uh, languages and, and lineages and legends and things of that nature and all the fossilizations and the dead animals all over the planet and the waters that came from above and the waters that burst through, uh, below. And then last time we saw, God pulled the plug. And when he pulled the plug, according to the Bible, the waters began to recede and it created this galloping runoff. I mean, a massive sheets of water going across. And that explains the topography that we have today. And we saw that with the evidence of the rapid water, the rapid erosion, and rapid modern examples with the Mount St. Helens. And we saw that because of the one catastrophe, Mount St. Helens, in our lifetime, so we got to witness it, it's documented for us, okay? We got to see that that one event, not in millions and billions of years, but literally in a matter of minutes, it carved a canyon 1,000 feet wide, 1 40th to the scale of Grand Canyon with all the layers in the whole nine yards. And a little bitty, teeny tiny creek, a river called the Toodle River runs through it. That river didn't cause that. That river is, is a result of that with one catastrophe with water spilling over, okay? And so that's what we saw. That's what's sad. And when we look at all the scarring, even Grand Canyon, all the topography and the hills and the bent rock layers and all that stuff that we see all around Las Vegas, what is God saying? You don't believe me? Look at the topography. I judge this planet once because of sin. You better pay attention because I'm going to do it again, Okay? And that's what's sad. But that's not all. The sixth evidence that God really did judge this planet once with the worldwide flood is the evidence of a gargantuan boat. Okay? How many guys got a boat? Right? How many guys would like to have a boat this big? No, you don't, because you don't have a truck to pull it. Okay? But anyway, I know you. But it's a guy thing. You could try. You could try. Bust out some transmissions. Unless, of course, you had Orson build it for you. You might be able to pull it off. Okay? Uh, but anyway, so this is, you know, the premise that we have here is not only do we have people, believe it or not, who, uh, I don't know, just either are willingly ignorant as the Bible predicted they would be in the last days, or they just haven't done their homework because they're just parodying what the media says. You know, they not only say, oh, if there really was a worldwide flood, then we'd have plenty of evidence of that. Well, we do. That's what we've been doing for five studies. Okay. All over geology, there's tons of evidence there was a worldwide flood. The second thing that they usually attack is Noah. Right? And they say, Noah, are you serious? You mean to tell me there was really this guy named Noah, and he really built this big old giant boat, and he really put you know, all the animals on the planet on this boat, and you mean to tell me that's real? I mean, that's just fairy tale stuff. That's just you know, caricatures that they put on Sunday school walls or flannel graph. Remember those days, flannel graph? How many guys bring tears to your eyes of the days of flannel? Yeah, whatever. Okay. But, uh, but they say that, right? They just make fun. Now they start making fun of the whole idea that there was a guy, really, literally, a guy named Noah and this big old giant boat chock full of animals, right? Okay? Well, let's take a look at that tonight, and let's see who's telling the truth, folks. And the first thing we're going to do is take a look at God's account. Genesis chapter 6. Let's take a look there. Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 through 22. Let's see what the Bible says about this Noah guy and this big old giant boat that Joey wish he could have. Uh, but, dude, there's no thing you could do, don't you? Trust me, we'll get to the dimensions in a little bit. There's not a truck on the planet big enough to haul it, okay? I'm sorry to let you down, okay? But I saw it enough time. Genesis chapter 6. Uh, let's take a look. Verse 11 through 22. Let's take a look at what's going on there. All right, Joey, when you get there, say move. All right, all right. You want to just do a token move? All right, thank you. All right, anyway, so let's go. Uh, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of what? Violence. And of course, God, he doesn't see all this stuff. He's on the backside of Pluto. Oh, I'm sorry, Ruth, wrong translation. Uh, no, God saw, he sees everything, folks. Hello, that's a wake-up call. How corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, hey, I'm going to put an end to all the people, okay? For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them, he says there, and the earth. Okay, so here's what you do. You make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, cut it with this pitch stuff inside and out. And this is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches to the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make the lower, middle, and upper decks. It's a triple decker. I'm going to bring, God says, floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. 
everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, and you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, keep them alive with you. Two of every what? Kind of bird. Of every what? Kind of animal. And every what? Kind of creature uh, that moves along the ground and will come to you to be kept alive. And you are to take uh, every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And Noah said, God, can I do this next week? There's a great game on. No, I don't think so, okay? He did everything God commanded him to do. And you betcha he did, right? God comes to you and says, I'm going to destroy the planet, but I got favor on you and your family. Start building this boat. What would you say? Yes, sir. How high, sir? How many nails? Where do I go to the hardware store? Why, hello, let's get started, right? Okay, but uh, that's not what we're going to talk about. What we're talking about is God not only for, uh, warned Noah that he was going to judge his whole planet because of sin, okay? But he commanded Noah, uh, here's what you do if you're going to escape it, right? What do you got to do? You need to build this big old boat, okay? And it's a big old boat, right? God gives us the dimensions, and again, we'll get into that in a little bit, okay? And then you're going to build this big old giant boat, and it's going to be so big that it is going to be able to hold two of every kind of air-breathing land animal. We'll get to that again later. That's important, okay? But that's still a lot of animals, okay? And, you know, the skeptic out there is going to say, well, so what, okay? Uh, that you didn't answer my question, okay? Of course, the Bible says that. That's where this whole idea with Noah comes from, right? And the R, okay? You didn't answer my question, okay? How do we know that this Noah guy, how do we know that this ark really was in existence? I mean, you would think that if this really existed and there was this global flood that we, and it was, a, it was that big of a boat and we're told exactly where it landed in the area that we'd find some evidence of this. Well, guess what? We do. We find a ton of evidence. And that's the first way that we know it really was real. This gigantic boat is the findings of the ark. Okay. And again, as I opened up uh, in the beginning, folks, uh, we don't just find uh, uh, the ark in recent times, you know, reports of it anyway. Uh, it's been going on for quite some time. Tons of people throughout history have claimed not only to find and see sightings of the ark, but actually retrieved remains of the ark, okay? And it's not, again, in just recent history. We're talking about even before the time of Jesus Christ, okay? And up until recently, as you will see, it was pretty much common knowledge that, oh yeah, you want to you want to you want to go see Noah's Ark? It's right over there. And that's what we're going to see tonight in the first half of our study. So let's take a look at some of that proof. The first one was back in 257 BC. Could have been before that, but this is what we have recorded for us. Uh, in 257 BC, a Chaldean historian, that's Babylonian times, okay, named Barosus wrote, quote, but of this ship that grounded in Armenia. Part of it still remains, and some still get pitched from it by scraping it off, using it for amulets to ward off evil. Now, what did the biblical account say? You need to pitch this baby inside and out. So 257 B.C., before Jesus' first coming, there was reports that people were going up and scraping that pitch off, making these amulets to ward off evil. Isn't that amazing? And that's actual recorded uh, a document. In 64 B.C., we're still not uh, at Jesus' first coming. Uh, Nicholas of Damascus was born. He became a Greek historian. He wrote this, There is a great mountain in Armenia upon which it is reported that many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved. Now stop right there. He's talking like this is common knowledge. You know, the deluge. Everybody knows about the deluge, the flood, right? Everybody knows about that, right? Number one. And so he says they fled at the time they were saved. And that one who was carried in an ark came on shore upon the top of it and that the remains of the timber were a great while preserved. This may be the man whom Moses, the legislator of the Jews, wrote. So it's there. Go check it out. It's probably what the Jews have been talking about in the Torah. Uh, first century, uh, historian Fla uh, Joseph uh, Flavius jo Josephus, he mentions art three different times in his writings that we find. He said, quote, the Armenians call that spot the landing place, for it is there that the ark came safe to land. And they show the relics of it to this day. So back then, they say, you want to go see it? Check it out. These guys got it, right? He also wrote, this flood and the ark are mentioned by all who have written histories of the barbarians. So not just the Jewish people, and not just the, everybody knows this. Even the barbarians are writing about the ark. Go check it out, right? Okay, the, the, these matters are also mentioned by uh, Hieronymus, the Egyptian author of the ancient history of Phoenicia, by Manasseh and many others, and they are still shown as such our desires to see them. 
So in other words, get down, go over there, climb that hill, it's right there. What's the big deal? Notice how it's common knowledge back then. I'm telling you, as you do the research, it's only until recently when Darwinian evolution started to come along that people started to scoff. But by and large, throughout history, everybody's, oh yeah, it's over there, go check it out. Okay, uh, 100 AD, <clears throat> 180 AD, Theophilus of Antioch, he said, and of the ark, the remains are to this day to be seen in the Arabian mountains. So it was still there. You could check it out then. Fourth century BC, uh, Bishop uh, Epiphanius Salamis wrote, do you seriously suppose, I love this one, do you seriously suppose that we are unable to prove our point when even to this day, the remains of Noah's ark are shown in the country of the Kurds? He's writing to skeptics apparently, right? And he's basically saying, excuse me, you really doubt what I have to say? You really don't think God's going to judge? Just get over there and go look at the boat, right? How can you sit there and be, just go over there, look at it, which tells you God judges his plan. At once, he's going to do it again. Are you serious, right? And he goes on, he says, why, were one to search diligently, doubtless, one would also find at the foot of the mountain, the remnants of the altar where Noah, on leaving the ark, offered clean and fatly animals as sacrifice to the Lord. So apparently back then, the fourth century, you could even see the ark, uh, as it says, that he actually sacrificed the animals. Remember, because he had to take some clean animals with him, okay, as well for sacrifices. Very interesting. Uh, again, fourth century, John Chrysostom, uh, Chrysostom said this, Do not the mountains of Armenia testify to it where the ark rested? And are not the remains of the ark preserved there to this very day for our what? Admonition? In other words, hey, what's the ark a reminder of? God judged this planet because of sin. That's for our admonition. So if he says he's going to do it again, you better pay attention. Don't believe me? Get up there and take a look at it. It's for everybody to see. Isn't that wild? Okay, 610 AD. This guy, Isidore Seville, wrote, Ararat is a mountain in Armenia where the historians testify that the ark came to rest after the flood. So even to this day, wood remains of it are to be seen there. So it's still there in 610 AD. Uh, 620, uh, Byzantine emperor, uh, Roman emperor Heraclius is reported to have visited the ark remains after he conquered the city of Persia. So you're in the area, you might as well, hey, go check out the ark. You know, kind of like a tourist thing, you know what have you. And that's in the writings there. 1245 AD, uh, this guy, Jehan Hython, whatever, a monk wrote, upon the snows of Ararat, a black speck is visible at all times. This is Noah's ark, right? You see that thing up there? Even from the ground, you don't have to climb. That's Noah's ark. Okay, 1245, all right, 14th century, Marco Polo actually wrote about it in his writings. Quote, the ark was reported to be on a very high mountain in central Armenia. Okay, 1663, a German scholar, this guy, Adam O'Leary, wrote, the Armenians and the Persians themselves are of the opinion that there are still upon the said mountain some remainders of the ark, but that time hath so hardened them that they seem to be absolutely petrified. Now, that's a key point. By the way, we saw in our young creation study, it doesn't take millions and billions of years for something to petrify, does it? With the right conditions and things of that nature. And so apparently by this time in the 1600s, roughly, the ark had finally petrified, the wood on the ark, okay? In Persia, we were shown a cross of a black and hard wood, which the inhabitants affirmed to have been made of the wood of the ark. So pay attention, because apparently people are now going up there and starting to take pieces off of it, which might explain what the next people start to do. They're starting to guard the ark because people are starting to scavenge it. 1829, this guy, this guy's a, a famous explorer, Perot, uh, he had made an ascent to Rat, wrote, quote, all Armenians are firmly persuaded that Noah's ark remains to this very day on the top of Mount Ararat, and that in order to preserve it, no human being is allowed to approach it. So now the Armenians are taking it serious. Ah, uh, you ain't going up there because people start to, you know, vandalize it, all right? So they start to preserve it. This is interesting. 1856, this guy, Hajay Yearman, said it was an unusually hot summer, so the snow and the glaciers had melted more than usual. So now things are really exposed. Uh, the Armenians were very reticent to undertake any expedition to the Ark because they feared God's displeasure. But the father of Haji thought that possibly the time had come when God wanted the world to know the Ark was still there. So he took it as a sign from God that, man, it's snow's really melted back. Ark is really visible Maybe God wants to get the word out. Listen to this. And that he wanted to prove to those atheists that the Bible story of the flood and the ark is true. This is wild. They went inside the ark and did considerable exploring. It was divided up into many floors and stages and compartments and had bars like animal cages of today. Interesting. How many guys would want to keep the, uh, keep the lion 
at bay a little bit there. Yeah. And, okay, and the whole structure was covered with a varnish or lacquer, you know, like the pitch, okay, and was very thick and strong, both outside and inside the ship. There was a great doorway of immense size, but the door was missing. The scientists, listen to this, were appalled and dumbfounded, okay, because they went up there and saw it, you couldn't deny it, and went into, his own words, satanic rage at finding what they hoped to prove non-existent. Listen to this. So they were so angry and mad that they said they would destroy the ship, but the wood was more like stone, and it had petrified by now, than any wood we know now. They did not have uh, tools or means uh, to wreck so mighty a ship and had to give up. They did tear out some timbers and tried to burn the wood, but again, it was so hard, it was almost impossible to burn. So they held a council and took a solemn and fearful death oath. Any man present who would ever breathe a word about what they had found would be tortured and murdered. That's science? Excuse me? Tortured and murdered if you say, hey, we saw it. Noah's Ark, it's real. Now, why do you think, notice the time frame, 1856. Why do you think they would go into a satanic rage when they found Noah's Ark? What was getting off the ground at that time? And boy, would that have really messed things up? And so they took an oath and says, we'll kill you. If you say anything about this. In 1915, just before Haji died at 75 years old, he told his story. Then in 1918, one of the three atheists on his deathbed told the story, which matched in every detail. 1883, Turkish scientists, soldiers, and British diplomat uh, Captain Gascoigne, there's a little thing there, uh, investigated an earthquake on Mount Ararat. And as they did, they were rewarded with the sight of a huge dark mass protruding 20 to 30 feet from the glacier on the left side of the ravine. They said it was in a good state of preservation and constructed of great strength, and that the interior was partitioned off into compartments about 12 to 15 feet high. Okay, 1908, Armenian immigrant, this George Hegopian, said the ark is resting on a huge rock, uh, but one of the side was on a cliff uh, on the edge of a steep cliff, and the mountain was impossible to climb from the side. But when I looked over the edge, I could see through the mist that the ark was very long and rectangular. That's important because that's exactly how we'll see later, Lord willing, how it was built. It was a big giant barge, just big giant rectangle. Parts of the bottom were exposed, and I could see that it was flat. The roof was also nearly flat, except for a row of windows, 50 or more. Now, what did God say? Build it up to 18 inches. What? Because that's you got windows on the top, and he saw that there, running from the front to back and covered by an overhanging roof. The side was tipped out a little from the bottom to top, and the wood also appeared to be entirely petrified. Okay. By this time, 1916, a Russian pilot, he reported flying over uh, Air Rat in World War I uh, that he saw the Ark. In fact, he gets back, he shares the news uh, with the Russian Tsar. He decides to send a couple large expeditions to the site. Soldiers found and explored the boat, but before they could report back to the Tsar, the Russian Revolution uh, began. The report disappeared and the soldiers were scattered. But uh, that was what was done. 1943, this guy, Ed Davis, uh, a sergeant in the U.S. Army, was stationed in Iran. Uh, he developed a close relationship with the lured tribesmen who said they knew the location of Noah's Ark. So Davis asked to see it, and they first took him to their village where he saw items from the Ark, a cage door, latches, a metal hammer, dried beans, shepherd's staffs, oil lamps, bowls, and pottery jars that still contained honey. Uh, the Muslim tribe considered it a religious duty to prevent outsiders from seeing the Ark, even killing them if necessary. Remember, people started to scavenge the Ark, right? So they, they wanted to protect it. However, their close relationship with Davis made him an exception. Now, we'll see later he goes back. Okay, 1953, this guy, George Green, he's an oil geologist. He photographed the Ark from a helicopter and described it as lying generally in a north-south direction, situated seemingly on a large rock shelf that was on the side of a vertical rock cliff at 13,000 to 14,000 feet level. His photographs disappeared in British Guyana when he was suddenly murdered in 1962. Kind of interesting there. 1950s, this guy, George Schwinghammer, claims he saw the Ark from an F-100 aircraft uh, while assigned to the 428th Tactical Fighter Squadron based in Turkey. Uh, he said it looked like an enormous boxcar. Again, why is that important? Because how is the Ark? That's what it was. A big, giant, long rectangle. Okay, Lying in a gully high up on Mount Ararat. He also said that U-2 pilots had also photographed it. Why don't you release those to the public? Interesting. Uh, 1986, so here's that Ed Davis guy. He goes back where he's escorted by a tribal leader named Abbas Abbas. Uh, steep rocks made slick by the rain prevented them from getting closer than uh, one half mile to the ark. 
But this time he saw two broken portions of the ark lying on the sides, one third of a mile apart. And during the moments when the fog and the clouds had lifted, he could see wooden beams, three decks, remember the biblical accounts of triple decker, okay, and various rooms. The tribal leader also told Davis other details about the ark, that its wood was extremely hard, again petrified, that wooden pegs were used in its construction, and that a large side door opened from the bottom outward like a garage door, and that human quarters consisted of 48 compartments in the middle of the top uh, uh, deck. And in 1986, several dozen ARC researchers questioned Davis extensively. 1989, he even passed a lie detector test. Okay, uh, 1900s, you got in 73, 76, but 90 and 92 satellites photographed what was called the Ararat anomaly. And the Defense Intelligence Agency did not rule out uh, the possibility that it could be a man-made object. So they're starting to identify it with satellites. 2006, this guy, Bob Cornuke, took a team of 14 American businessmen, law ministry leaders to visit uh, the site purported to be the resting place of the ark. What they discovered was an object of, here it is again, 13,000 feet level uh, uh, that had the appearance of blackened, petrified wooden beams. It was about the size of a small aircraft carrier, he said, and was consistent with the dimensions provided in the book of Genesis. They also reported to find fossilized sea creatures inside the petrified wood and immediate vicinity of the site. That's interesting. Again, what would sea creatures be doing at 13,000 feet level, as we saw before? Okay, 2007, a joint Turkish-Hong Kong expedition claimed to have found an unusual cave with fossilized wooden walls on Mount Ararat uh, above the vegetation line. They, this marked the first time in history that an alleged material sample, okay, been a lot of reports, but they brought back a material sample of the ark to uh, retrieve for lab analysis. Uh, the sample determined by the University of Hong Kong's Department of Earth Sciences says, hey, this is in fact petrified wood, which again fits all the samples. And in 2010, they go back, this time with a video camera. Okay, it's a joint uh, Turkish-Chinese expedition, and they released the video of what they saw. Here's what they found up there on video. Some say yeah, some say no, I don't know. Let's take a look at what they found. Animals went in two by two, hurrah. Sure, the animals went in two by two, but where did they get off? A question that's vexed us for centuries. Bible scholars say somewhere out here in eastern Turkey, Mount Ararat has long been the favored theory. Now a group of Turkish scientists and Noah fans, evangelical Christians from Hong Kong, claim they found chunks of his eponymous ark. Wooden chambers still intact, up here two and a half miles above sea level. Hang on, is that straw? I, I saw uh, a wood frame um, in the uh, glacier. Waar staat de grote Ararat om bekend? Dat er zich nog enige resten van de Ark van Noach zich zouden bevinden ergens bij de top. I, I saw the other um, wood uh, structure and then some uh, wood in a cave. That cave was quite uh, big. Um, the depth was uh, 12 meter.
The word carbon dates to around the time Noah was afloat. What, what do you think it is about the story that just, uh, we're, we're enthralled with it? We are. Um, people have been trying to find Noah's Ark for, for years now. And I think in a way, it's because they're trying to verify the Bible. If you can find a piece of Noah's Ark, mm -hmm. then the Ark must be real, then the Flood must be real, then the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament are real. I mean, you can make it go uh, upon, you know, layer upon layer. So I think people are looking to verify their faith, basically. Yeah. I would say so. And that's the common sense response. And I think that explains, again, why those guys went into a satanic raid. Because if this gets out, uh-oh, the Bible's real. Uh-oh, wait a second. What was the purpose the Bible said of the flood? Oh, God judged this world once. Well, what's that? If you keep reading the New Testament, what's God going to do in the future? Oh, he's going to judge it again. Um, we better pay attention. Satan, God, the little God, the little G of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Why? I really think in these last days, evolution is that blinder. Okay. But I don't know about you, but once again, just to you know, play the, the role of skeptic, you know, too bad we didn't have any evidence of uh, Noah and Noah's Ark you know, outside the Bible. Uh, we do. You know, uh, whatever your opinion is on that video, but whatever, but look at, look at throughout history. Multitude of accounts. Okay? And that's exactly what you'd expect to find if, in fact, this really was uh, an actual event. Okay? The second evidence showing us there really was a huge, massive, giant, gargantuan boat is the feasibility of the thing. Okay? Because again, the skeptics, you know, they might say something like this. They'll say, okay, so fine, there's evidence that the ark very well has been recorded for us throughout history outside the Bible. But uh, what about the feasibility of that thing? You mean to tell me that there really was a guy who could really single-handedly, apparently with his sons or something, his family, could build a boat that big, so big, that it's going to hold all those animals and not crack up and sink at the very first try, right? Uh, yeah. And the reason why is because God is the one who gave him the plans. And how many guys have learned this one? This will preach, but this isn't the message tonight. When you follow God's plan, it's awesome. Yeah, and he knows what he's doing. All right, now that'll preach, right? So God's plans always work out. So let's put it to the test, okay? The first evidence shown us that this was a feasible boat, not make-believe, okay, is in the re design requirement, okay? When God designed this thing, he knew exactly what he was doing. In fact, he was very specific to record those for us. Let's take a look at that text again. Tonight, Genesis chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. So God says this, here you go. Here's your design requirement. Here's your blueprints. So make for yourself an ark of cypress wood, okay? And make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. You know, that stuff they were scraping off to make those ambulance, or amulets. And uh, this is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, okay? Uh, make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches to the top. Again, there's going to be like a row, uh, if you will, of windows. Now, why would that come in handy? Well, let's see outside, number one. Uh, I would say with all those animals on the boat, some fresh air once in a while wouldn't hurt. <laughs> After a while, a couple days, no showers. Anyway, uh, put a door in the side of the ark and make what? Lower, middle, and upper decks, just like reports, triple decker, right, is what they saw. And that's what God said to, to, to build it with, okay? And that's the dimensions, okay? God gives us the exact dimensions. It's a certain type of wood, cypress wood there. Uh, it's, uh, a, you know, approximately 450 feet long. You can just based on the cubit. That's a whole other issue. Is it the Egyptian or whatever? But basically, pr approximately 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. And here's the point, okay? Based on what we know, let's put it to the test. And by the way, this has been put to the test, and this is what I'm going to share with you. These dimensions have been put to the test by secular modern shipbuilders. They've made computer models. They've built replicas of it. They put it through these wave machines and all this stuff, right? They put it to the test, okay, and to see if it was a seaworthy vessel, let alone could it survive a massive global worldwide flood. And as a result, this is a direct quote. They said, I'm not making this up, somebody knew what they were doing when they came up with the dimensions of Noah's Ark. <laughs> I love that comment, right? Okay, and that these dimensions, listen, are very similar to the dimensions of a modern-day ocean liner. Okay, and in fact, they went ahead and put it to the test. And here's what they said. Uh, thanks to modern technology, they realized with these dimensions, putting it through the wave test and all that other stuff, that the ark had total stability, total comfort, and total strength. Based on its dimensions, we know that if the ark had been a little bit taller, it would have become unstable. 
Had it been a little bit longer, it possibly would have broken in two. If it was wider or shorter, then it would become dangerously uncomfortable. Modern shipbuilders say based on this design, the ark would have been almost impossible to tip over. Can I translate that for you? God knows how to build a boat. Right? His plans, this will preach, are always the best way. Perfect design, they said, to survive a year-long flood. Okay? So it was completely feasible. And that's with modern shipbuilding. They put it to the test. Hey, wow, these dimensions really work. Okay? The second evidence showing us that there really is a, a gargantuan boat. It was completely feasible. Of course, comes up to the next skeptical thing, the space requirement. And this is where you just need to do your math, okay? Because the skeptic, again, this is where they'll come up to. And they say, okay, so maybe this was a seaworthy vessel. I'll give you that. Maybe we do see evidence outside of the Bible of the existence of this thing throughout different uh, time frames in history, okay? But you mean to tell me that this boat could actually feasibly hold uh, all the animals on the planet? Well, no, it can't hold all the animals on the planet. And the reason why we know that is because you didn't read your Bible. The Bible did not say Noah had to bring... Oh, by the way, the Bible says, we might get to this later, uh, Noah did not have to, as the skeptic would say, it would take him how many years to get all the animals and... Get? No, the, God made the animals come to him. Right? Oh, you mean God... Hey, hello, God can create the world just like that. You don't think he can make animals come to Noah? Give me a break. All right? Is a skeptic, okay? But, you know, but they'll sit there and say, you mean to tell me that all... No, he didn't have to bring all of them. According to the Bible, God put in some limiting factors. Okay, limiting factors, and uh, this boat with these sizes of dimensions had plenty of space for all the things that God said uh, to bring along, okay? And the first thing that Noah did not have to bring on this ark, okay, was the water animals, okay? God said bring two of every single, not just every single thing on the planet, but two of every kind of air-breathing land animal, not the water ones. And when you take out that number, because the, the skeptics come up with these huge numbers, we've calculated all the species on the planet, and it's impossible to do Read your Bible. He didn't have to bring everything. So let's just minus all the water animals that don't need to go on the ark, okay? And this guy's actually done it. Uh, Ernst Mayer, he's America's leading taxonomist. I kind of say he knows what he's talking about. He said, the vast majority of the species in the world are fully capable of surviving in the water and thus did not need to be brought on the ark which is why God said not to bring them, okay? For instance, Noah did not need to make provision for the 21,000 species of fish or the 1,700 tunicates or the 600 echinoderms, including starfish and sea urchins, or the 107,000 mollusks, such as mussels, clams, and oysters, or the 10,000 salinorants, like the coral sea anemones or jellyfish, or the 5,000 species of sponges, or even the 30,000 different protozoans. Furthermore, some of the mammals are aquatic, like whales and seals and dolphins, so... He wouldn't need to bring those along. Then there's the amphibians. They don't need to be included, uh, nor do the reptiles, such as turtles or alligators, right? They could survive, especially on some wreckage and things of that nature. Uh, furthermore, some of the, uh, he goes on and says, the large number of arthropods, numbering 838,000 species, such as the lobsters, shrimps, clams, and that's right, who could forget, water fleas, uh, and barnacles <laughs> are also marine creatures, so they don't need to come along. And finally, there's the multitude of insect species, including just the 35,000 species of worms, all of which could easily survive outside the ark, floating on pieces of debris, etc. Right? So you, whatever that big giant number that the skeptics keep wanting to come up with, you minus all that, and that's a big reduction. But you got to read the Bible, Right? And that was the first limiting thing, okay? But that's still not all. God puts in a second limiting factor, okay? A second limiting factor. And he said that Noah did not need to bring two of every species. He just needed to, and that's why, I, that's why I highlighted it when we're reading through that, two of every kind, okay? You don't need, again, we've seen this example before, but now we're going to look at it again in this context. You do not need to bring two of every species of dog, Okay? Uh, it used to be like 250. I think it's more than 300 now. You just need to bring, according to God, two of the dog kind. And you need to make sure that one's a male, one's a female. That comes in handy later, right? But that's all you need. You don't need the 300, how many species are up to today, okay? You just need, okay, uh, two of the kind, okay? So that means you start putting in that limiting factor and uh, it reduces the number even much more drastically, right? Now you get that when you just read the Bible. Okay, and but again, when you start talking about this kind versus species thing, even then, then the skeptic goes to stage two on that issue, and they'll say something like this that we've talked about before. They'll say something. Oh, you mean to tell me that all the dogs in the world today 
came from two dogs on Noah's Ark. You mean to tell me you believe that? Yeah. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I don't have a problem over the last 44, 4,500 years or so, two dogs, maybe starting with medium size, you know, whatever they were, okay? And we know that just with one litter, you get all different kinds of different colors, different sizes, you get runts, you get big ones, large, right? That's just one litter. Now extrapolate that over litters, over litters, over litters for 44, 4,500 years. I don't have a problem with all that. And then, of course, mankind moving in and deliberately doing it themselves, okay? I, that, I don't have a problem with that. It makes sense. As we've seen before, now we're going to see it again in this context. The evolutionist is the one who's got the big problem. Because our story is biblically based that, yeah, all the dogs came from two dogs in Noah's Ark. you got a bigger problem if you believe in evolution. Like this guy points out. Let's take a look at that. I was doing a, asked me to speak at this college in Boston one time. This preacher called all the colleges and universities around Boston. I got my charts out and I said, now folks, I believe the Bible. <clears throat> Nobody cheered. I said, I believe about 6,000 years ago God made everything. The world's not millions of years old. And 2,000 years ago Jesus came and I gave him the basic Bible story, okay? Then I told them what they believe. Because most of them don't know what they believe, you have to tell them. <laughs> you guys believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, made a hard rocky crust, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And this early life form found somebody to marry. <laughs> Boy, now that's a good trick. And something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. One professor was getting kind of upset about this time. I seem to do that to them. He said, uh, Mr. Hoven, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world. I said, yes, sir, you're right about that. He said, you mean to tell me that you believe all these dogs came from two dogs off of Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? Ha, ha, ha. I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> I had one lady, I'm sorry, a woman, come to me after a debate one time. She was steaming down the aisle, boy, she was mad. Oh, I could tell I'm in trouble now. I stood there quivering in my boots, you know. She walked up and she said, tonight, you said, we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, well, ma'am, calm down just for a minute. I said, do you believe in evolution? She said, yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, well, would you please tell me then where we came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, uh, where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, where did that come from? She said, well, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. <laughs> and you could see it was slowly dawning on her. I do believe I come from a rock, don't I? <laughs> yes, ma'am, you do. You ought to be proud of it. Hey, don't step on Grandpa, whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but how many of you guys are going to stick to the story of, yes, all the dogs came from two dogs in Noah's Ark? Okay, I think I'll skip the rock version. Uh, apparently, you've got to be really religious for that. I just can't make the cut, personally. Okay, but again, let's, let's push it even further, all right? So, so you've got some limiting factors, all right? You don't have to bring all the water animals and aquatic animals there. Uh, you don't have to bring two of every single species, but just two of every kind, and that limits it as well. But that's still, granted, that's still a lot of animals, right? Okay, you do the math. And it is, okay? So based on these design requirements from God, is there enough room on Noah's Ark? Well, what we're going to see is there not only was enough room on Noah's Ark, there was room to spare. You could have had a dance party if you wanted to. I don't know if you did that. I uh, kind of doubt it. Uh, but anyway, but there was a lot. But we're out of time, so we're going to have to deal with that. Lord will next week. Sorry, Joey. You'll make it, bro. Just keep praying. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. 
The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, Let's take a a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, The Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, We've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, It could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, That means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word, Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy, okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pull the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, The Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, In life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, The courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, They are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, As they're sitting there in the jail cell, Uh, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, There's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, If he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it. If he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely 
of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.